Hey guys, this is Azdajuki, and today I'm going to be showing you a behind the scenes look at this touch screen in Minecraft. If you guys haven't seen the showcase video for this, please click the annotation on the screen right now. and It'll take you over there and you guys can check it out for yourself. Definitely worth a watch if you haven't already seen it, otherwise you're going to be fairly confused. Alright, so I'm going to jump in and show you guys a bunch of different technologies that I use for this and how you can use them in your own way. So, to kick it off, I'll show you guys how these pixels were accomplished. So I've gone ahead and chopped away the sides here so you guys can see in underneath. And what we have is a whole bunch of redstone item drops. Now these can be any item drops, I just use redstone because redstone's cool. So as we can see, we have a whole bunch of them respawning and despawning really quickly on top of these pressure plates. And then those pressure plates in turn are activating the pixels above them like this. That's how that works. And then, so up here we can see the picture is lit up via these entities under underneath. Now these item drops are coming from spawners up above us in all this redstone. So each pixel down here, so say this pixel right here with this item drop would be coming from a spawner up there, right? So this grid up here has a grid of spawners just like this. They're obviously more spaced out, that way there's room to fit redstone. So that is in a nutshell how that works. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump up there and show you the spawners because these spawners have a bunch of custom properties to be able to achieve this. So yeah. So here we are up above the touchscreen itself, and here we can see the grid of mob spawners. So we can see which ones are activated and deactivated. So we can see this one here is active, this one here isn't, and so on and so forth. So up here we can actually see the pattern that is happening down below. So here, if I run over this way a little bit, we should be able to see my symbol that is being drawn. So here's one pixel of it, and if we go up a little bit, there's another, 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 and another. Now these mob spawners are controlled by an entity cap around them, and that's what this, this whole dispenser unit for is for. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is just jump into a different world and show you guys exactly how that works. Then I'll jump into a bunch of programs that are external to Minecraft, and show you exactly how to make one of these spawners for yourself and how to utilize it. So here we are, and now I can show you guys exactly how this little unit here works. So for every pixel, there is one of these units, and I'll break it down for you right now. So up here, we have an instant RS NOR latch, which has two inputs. So here we have set, and then the blue one here is reset. Now down here, we have a dispenser with a lava bucket in it. And then on the side here, we have a dropper with a whole bunch of redstone entities um, for item drops. Now these can be any. I just use redstone again because redstone's cool and I'm just sort of keeping the same sort of material that I'm using to spawn on the pixels as here. You don't have to do that, this can be anything. And yeah, so that's just chock full of them. And what this does is the spawner has an entity cap, that way within two blocks of it in each direction, if there is any, any entity, then it will not be able to spawn anything. So up here we can see there's an entity on top, and if I take it away, now it is active again. Now to fix that. Now, if this dispenses another one, we can see, boom, now it's deactivated again. So if we go up here, and we see now it's reset, because it's not activated, right? So if we come over here and activate it, what it's going to do is it's going to put this lava on top here. Oh, there's a button over here, so it's not able to spawn. Here we go. So now it's going to put this lava on top. Now, because when you put down an item drop, after five minutes, that will despawn. So if you have a pixel that needs to be off for more than five minutes, this is an issue, because then it would turn back on, because the item around the, uh, the mob spawner would disappear. So it would reactivate. So that's what this lava is for. Um, what, what you have is you have a line like this that runs to all of these dispensers, and then every five minutes, this will actually clock, and that'll pulse, and then that'll actually put in more entities now, the reason the lava's there is so that it'll remove any entities that are already in there, and then it'll stay there. So now, even when it's on, and then you pulse it every five minutes, it's not going to turn off. So that's what the lava's for. So if I go back to reset, now say this despawned, before that happened, the five minutes would have hit, so it would have put another item in it to make sure that it's definitely off. So that's what that is for. All right, so now I'm going to jump into MC Edit and another custom spawner creating program and show you guys exactly how to make one of these spawners. We're gonna make it spawn up over on that pixel right there. So before we go jumping into any programs, you're going to want to come over to your pixel and stand on top of it, bring up your F3 screen, 
note down your x coordinate your y coordinate and your z coordinate now with the y you want to grab your feet position not your eyes position so that's just the first number here so in my case it is 58 so you're going to want to note them down and then we'll jump over into the programs all right so the first program you're going to need is a program called camus custom spawners you can find the link to that in the description below so what you want to do when you're in here is you want to just come in here and then you want to tick all of these boxes down to spawn range you want to put the delay at zero min spawn delay three max at three as well spawn count to one maximum nearby entities to one as well the required player range put that up to like a thousand or a big number that way it's always active spawn range one that's all you need to do on this tab then come over to position slash motion now you're going to want to tick this box here now this is where you put in your coordinates so you want to put in your coordinates here and then put a 0.5 on the end just to make sure that it spawns in the middle of the block. And do that the same for that with the 0.5 with your Z coordinate. Now with your Y coordinate, put a 0.2 on the end. That way it's just sitting right on top of the pressure plate. That looks the best in my opinion. Now what you want to do as well is come over to Mob Motion Data, tick that and set them all to zeros. Now in the Item Blocks and Music tab, which is the second from the most to the right, right here, I'm going to tick age and ID. Now ID, this is the block ID of whatever item you want to use. Actually item ID, sorry my bad. Then age you want to put up to 6000. Now that is because 6000 is the, that, that's up to, that's five minutes. So at that point in time it will despawn instantly. So that's what we want. Make sure they're both ticked. And then once that's done, come over here and click add entity. Once you've done all of those options. And down the bottom here put in the entity name that you want and click create spawner. Now that's going to put the spawner wherever it is that you have installed this program. Now we can jump over into MC Edit and I can show you what to do with that. So now that you're in MC Edit, the link is in the description if you do not have it. You want to click Load World and just click on your world right there, load it up. And now if it's not a single player world, you can just click Open World instead of Load and it'll come up like that. Now come over to your, wherever you want to put your spawner and click Import. Now you have to locate wherever it is you installed Kami's Custom Spawners. Now I have it here, and I've saved it into the schematics folder right here. So I called it Test. Now I open it, and then it'll give you the spawner. All you need to do is click where you want it, and click Import, and there it is. Now all you've got to do is click Save, and it'll save the world. Now you can just jump straight back into Minecraft. All right, so now we're back in Minecraft, and we can see right here there's a glitched entity that is around it, which is preventing it from spawning. So all we've got to do is pick that up, and it'll start spawning away. So over here we can see, see it works. Now, it works perfectly. So we can come over here and as we can see at the moment, this is actually out of sync. So this is set to reset, but there's no item on top because of that weird item that appeared. All you gotta do for that is just put a bit of redstone there and then that'll update this dispenser because it's already powered and it'll redispense. So now we can see it's off. And if I click set, it's now on, reset, it's now off. And that is how the pixels were accomplished. Alright, so that's how each individual pixel works. Now, as I was mentioning before about this whole despawn thing, how after 5 minutes, if the pixel needs to be off, it will turn on. So the way that's fixed is by running this line in behind these dispensers, and then that goes into this machine right here, which is just a dispenser that triggers itself, which is basically a despawn timer. That goes into this monostable with a little bit of delay. And whenever this runs behind these, it would seem like that wouldn't activate it, but what it does is dispensers have some weird quirks to them, so this dispenser here, since it's constantly powered, when this here updates, can you see that? The dispenser actually fires. So yeah, that'll actually activate all of them and re-update that. So that's how that works. And then as far as memory goes and, and how things control these pixels, is up here, this blue here, these top two blue ones are different reset lines. And then this blue one and these three green ones are ROM. So as we can see here, whenever this line here turns off, all of them turn off and then if there's a torch here that'll turn on and then set the pixel so that is basically how pictures are stored now this whole machine uses a lot of instant wire which is how pistons can um, when they retract this block will disappear instantly causing stuff to be instant but um, it all has to be on an inversion and it has to be used in certain ways but yeah I've utilized that in almost everywhere like even with these OR gates here to detect where people are to make this as fast as it can be so it'll actually recall the frame instantly. As you can see in the video, it doesn't sort of trickle from one corner to the other. It'll recall all at once really quickly. So that is also how that works. 
So the way the gestures were accomplished is via this little bit here, the brown circuitry. So the gestures are the ones that go from one side of the screen to the other, used for unlocking and changing pages and stuff like that. So basically it's controlled by this one tick clock here to check the player position and it checks the player position via these test for commands. So for each pixel there is a test for command and it checks for the nearest player to the coordinate of that pixel with a radius of one so that if it, if the player is standing say on that pixel right there or whatever that when that that test for block is command block is triggered and the player is on it, it'll give a redstone output, and that is basically how I can detect where players are. So the way this works, in a nutshell, is when a player is on that side, it'll trigger this circuitry, and then if it finds the player on the other side of the screen within a certain amount of delay, which, which is the amount of time it would take to walk that far, so you can't sort of deviate off and do, you know, circles and then walk to the other side. It has to be just like a straight path to the other side, which is this amount of delay here. It'll check to see if they're over there on the other side as well. So say if it checks over that side and it finds the players there, then after the amount of delay is on the other side, that means that he swiped the screen. Then it works the same the other direction. Then I can just hook them up into different applications and use them in different ways. But that in a nutshell is how the gestures work. So yeah. So the entire device is controlled by this entire logic unit here. Um, it is a massive mess of wiring and latches and logic to just determine lots and lots of different circumstances and what needs to happen when different things happen. Oh, it's a nightmare even just to fly around and show you guys um, what I had to do to make all of this work. So as you can see here, there's a latch. Um, there's latches down here for different things like that one there's for the clock for the gestures down here that's one for the lock screen for that for the app home screen for um, resets you know things like that um, command blocks to say different things as they happen so this entire chunk here basically determines everything that happens and that is a runoff two command blocks down here that are on a clock so this one here will check to see if they've locked it so if they're standing on the block that locks it, and this one here will be the home button, then they all, all go off into different latches to determine like what states they're in and what they need to do. So everything is controlled by this, this unit here. So yeah, that's how that basically works. <laughs> so as far as the home screen goes with pressing different buttons and things, there are two buttons that can be pressed on either screen. So as we can see here, this orange here, this orange circuit here and this one down here, is basically an OR line between these command blocks. So it'll check every block on the, when it's on the home screen, it'll check every block on the button to see if they're standing on it or not. And that all goes into this instant, instant stuff here. That's basically a giant OR gate. So if the player stands on any, anywhere in that area while it's on the home screen, it'll give an output. And same for this one down here. And then you can use them to determine oh, which page were you on and which button did you press. And then with that, you can launch whatever app you need to do. So now I'm going to go ahead and jump into a couple of the apps and show you guys how they work. So to start off with, we're going to go with paint. So all this purple circuitry around here, purple wool, all of that is for that app. So over here, we can see where it is controlled from. Just over here. Yeah, if I can ever get there. All right, so it's controlled from this torch here, which is basically controlled by a latch and a bunch of extra logic attached to it, so it can reset at different times and be activated at others. And what it does is when this here is actually deactivated, let's delete all this redstone because it's on an inversion for the instant wire. So when all of them retract, these torches here turn on, which push down these pistons, which allows these test four commands to activate. Now, when those test four commands are then allowed, it'll also trigger, the latch up here will also trigger this line here, which will basically clock every eight ticks or so, like that, and that'll pulse every single command block for every pixel. And then that'll basically update each command block to check if there's a player on it. So say if there was a player at this position, it would output, go down, and then set the pixel. It's that simple. So, and then obviously when this line up here is on, when it's not running paint, it won't set it. And that's basically how paint works. It's a very simple program compared to something like the day daylight sensor one, but yeah. 
All right, so the second app is very simple. Um, what it does is when it's called, which is down here, I'll actually just call this blue line right here, which is ROM. So it's very simple. It's the checker pattern app, if you haven't seen it. So it'll basically just recall the checker pattern on the screen to show that it is a one by one pixel display. And what it'll do is when it's recalled is it'll just basically, this line here will turn off on all of them and then every second one will turn on. That's pretty much it. And then when you quit the app, it'll reset. So that's as simple as it gets with an app. It's basically just a picture that it recalls. Whereas the daylight sensor, which I'm gonna show you now, is a lot more complicated. So as we look around here, we can see a whole lot of cyan wool. Now all of that is for the daylight sensor. I'll show you guys how that works right now. So this here is on an inversion and that's where it comes in. Basically what it will do is it'll run to do two things. It will then allow by this torch here coming on because that then goes off. It'll then allow these daylight sensors to interact. So that, that block there will go into there. And then allow everything to work with each bar that goes across. And then what it'll also do is this line here will instantly retract on all of them, which will then set a rectangle, it basically goes around in a giant rectangle around it, just to set the rectangle around the progress bar. Now let me just look at one of these units right here. So as we can see, we have a daylight sensor hooked up into comparator with signal strength going into it. Now the signal strength gets lower and lower as it goes in that direction. So as we can see here, these blocks get one further away, if you can see that or not. Um, so see, this one here is on that block, this one here is on the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So the signal strength gets lower and lower as it goes that direction. That way they each, they each trigger with a different level of light. Now when it outputs, this here will be out like that, because it has been deactivated, because it's now in the working state. And that will then recall this. So that is like, if, if it is lighter, then what the signal strength is, then it'll output and then allow that bar to be activated. And then it's quite simple on the inversion, it'll reset it. So on the inversion, it'll go up into a monostable, which will just shorten the pulse. And then it'll pulse the reset line for that same bar. So that obviously when it gets, when it gets darker than what this actually allows, it'll then reset it. So that in a nutshell is how the daylight sensor works. And then there is basically, I think there's 12, of these units with the different bars with different signal strengths so that they will trigger at different times and that is how the daylight sensor works so to lock the screen all it needs to do is it just checks to see the position and then it'll basically set this latch here which tells the machine I'm locked now and then it'll just go through and trigger a master reset line which is this right here and that'll basically just clear all of these pixels to this state um, on each one of the pixels. And that's as simple as locking gets. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, obviously, there is actually a lot more to it. Um, as you can see, you know, I'm not going to go through and explain every single aspect of this because I would be here for hours. But I really hope you guys have picked up some little techniques and technologies that you can use in your own projects. Uh, yeah, I hope you got something out of it. So yeah guys, uh, I thank you for watching, and yeah, I'll see you guys next time.